memorize the rules. You don't need to memorize the exceptions. You don't need to memorize the exceptions to the exceptions. These things are complicated, um, but that's why you have uh, Rich and I to, and Kathy to, if there's one of those issues. Now, these issues don't come up that often, but it's a good idea in the back of your mind to know what those issues can be. So I'm just going to hit the highlights here. Um, the Illinois Municipal League has a lot of good information. And this is just another handbook that I have here for you. But, you know, things like holding other offices. If you get a, an opportunity to serve another governmental body, you have to be careful about conflict of interest. So always be careful when you hear that. Can you volunteer? Can you do this? Can you do that in other governmental bodies that you don't create a conflict of interest? Usually there's not. But once in a while, there could be a conflict of interest, which could be a problem. If there is a conflict of interest, the problem is that you accept another position you then effectively resign from this position. So be careful. That's just one of those things. It doesn't happen very often, but once in a while you'll, you know, how would you like to serve on the state highway, uh, you know, toll, 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 toll road authority? Um, is that a conflict or not? And those are the kind of issues that Kathy and I would have to resolve. Uh, one of the other issues that come up quite often, and I'm on page three here, uh, issues about the employee handbook. We do have a fairly extensive employee handbook. Uh, it was just updated a few years ago. And the question always comes up, as an elected official, am I an employee? Well, it's, it's not a real simple answer, but recently what has happened is the state of Illinois has started to enact certain regulations that provide that such things as, as examples here that I've got on the bottom of page three, sexual harassment. Last year, the state legislature said each municipality has to provide a specific sexual harassment policy that applies both to its employees and elected officials. So when that happens, what we usually do is we just make the elected officials subject to that section in the employee handbook, which is section 402. Uh, nothing new, but just to advise you again that that's important because that requirement does affect you. Now, you're not, in the sense, an employee that if you violate it, um, you're going to be disciplined as an employee. There's other issues that would come up. But we don't want to have sexual harassment. We have a rule against it. We follow the state law, and therefore, you know, we're in compliance with that requirement. Another one that happened two years ago was travel. Travel became a big issue about reimbursements and what we pay for, and we have a travel policy. Um, and if you're, you know, get into a situation where you want to look at it, ask Rich, um, you can get a hold of that policy. But the policy complies with the state statutes. No entertainment, no entertainment expenses. And that was a big issue a couple of years ago. People were going around and paying for entertainment. Uh, there is a maximum reimbursement amount. Uh, of course, the village board can approve more, but all receipts are public documents, all those things to be a little more transparent as to that. Uh, in addition, of course, any federal and state rules uh, require uh, compliance with everybody, not just employees, not officials. But we get all over to the issue regarding employees. In Section 4 of the, the rules, there's a section regarding employee behavior. Now, I usually talk about, you know, it's kind of do as I say, not as I do kind of argument. Um, I think there's some, some of those things in here that would apply. Uh, Drug-free workplace, smoke-free workplace. I mean, I don't want to see elected officials smoking up here in the diet. Uh, you can't do it. Uh, you know, those kind of things. It, it's pretty common sense. Um, but if you would happen to, as part of our duties, drive a vehicle, use our equipment, other things, there are rules and regulations that affect, just like the employees do, the use of village uh, equipment. Um, the next one is, is comes up every once in a while. Again, it's confidential information. We, if you look, I did provide there a section 2-323, which is the village's code provisions regarding disclosure of confidential and privileged information. This is usually in closed meetings or executive sessions, and we call them here. Uh, the reason we're in closed meetings is because we don't want to make that public. Um, it can cause substantial harm if confidential or privileged information gets out. If Kathy or I ask you about acquiring property, and we agree that it's worth $100,000, but you give us authority up to $125,000. Uh, if the other side hears it's going to be $125,000, I'll never get it for less than $125,000. So yeah, it could affect negotiations, it could affect settlement agreements, all those kind of things. Confidential is confidential. It stays within the, um, within the closed meeting. Um, Again, it's about ordinance violation, and you can, there's civil lawsuits, there's all kinds of other issues with there. Um, economic economic uh, interest statements, uh, a lot of people call them none forms at the bottom of page four. Every year by May 1, you have to file an updated uh, economic interest statement. I'm sure Hosanna does that, uh, and gets you the notices and go through it. Um, 
generally yeah. it doesn't apply to you. You had to file one when you ran for office, but Correct. once you were elected, you have to file another one? Well, the timing That's on that. That's what this sort of says. Well, no, it, it's May 1, and you have to do it by May 1, and I'll, I'll let Wazana Prime knows this better than I do. Do, you, do we send them out for the two new trustees to go ahead and refile to get them in by May 1 or not? The, um, the uh, DuPage okay. County, they will send that. Okay. It will go electronically, electronically to their to website. To if yeah. they want to do it for this exactly. year. Exactly. To um, emails. Because that's the issue. They're really not sworn in until after May 1. Mm -hmm. So technically, I don't think they really have to. I think some counties do it. But no matter what, the existing members of the, of the board and next year, everyone will have to file a new one by May 1. Right. And, and basically, the reason we call them unformed is you just put in there, not applicable, not applicable, not applicable, because you really haven't done any of those kind of things. Uh, one of the big three, uh, prohibited interest in contracts in here, I do have the uh, citation to the Illinois Municipal Code. It's that first sentence. It's very simple. It prohibits um, any municipal officers, who are elected officials, from having a financial interest uh, in any municipal contract. Um, it's pretty simple, and that is also both direct or indirect. Direct, it would be if um, you wanted to enter into a contract with the village and you're already sitting on the board, you can't do that, of course. Um, indirect is where you work for a co company that wants to do business with the board. Uh, that may or may not be a problem depending on whether or not you meet one of the exceptions. The bottom line is you can't have an interest in a contract, work, or business with a municipality in any of your property which we buy yourself. Yeah, that's pretty simple. It's not that complex. It is serious, though, in the sense that if there is this conflict um, regarding contracts, there's no way to do it other than, one, not do the contract, or number two, you resign from your position. It's serious, and that's why you'll see down here it's a class four felony. So you can't do it. That's the bottom line. Now, we do have some exceptions, of course, uh, and you can see there on page five, uh, advisory boards and commissions. Uh, relatives always come up a little bit. Um, a spouse, if a spouse has a corporation and it's not a subterfuge for the official's own financial interest, um, and that can be allowed. There, that again would have to be reviewed. Um, and an, it's something as simple as uh, elected officials, spouse uh, being an employee, or in a school district group, you know, a teacher would be uh, have uh, the spouse on the board. Uh, that also has been held to be uh, acceptable. Um, there are some exceptions. I put them on basically starting on page five and six here. Uh, they're basically small business exceptions. Um, and to know whether or not your business uh, is meets one of those exceptions, you have to look at it. The first one, you have to have less than 1% interest in stock that's nationally traded. you got to disclose. You have to uh, abstain from deliberations. Um, and it has to be approved uh, by a majority of those holding office. That's one exception. Uh, that's basically for if you have stock in a company and the village is going to enter into a contract with that company like Ford to buy a Ford truck. Um, you don't, you're not going to have... 1% uh, interest in Ford, uh, but that would allow that, that type of contract. Uh, another one is if you have less than a 7.5% interest, and this is just what the statute says, I don't know where they get their numbers, um, and you disclose your interest, you abstain from voting, uh, there's the $1,500 to $2,500 fiscal year requirement that you can have to accept to that amount. Uh, there's even a smaller exceptions for if you have greater than 7.5%, and I had this just a couple years ago in a different community, um, they wanted to do a $3,000 improvement. Uh, it was just really for the labor. But if you disclose your interest, you got more than a 7.5% interest, approved by a majority vote, contracts between two and four, that is acceptable. So again, when these kind of situations occur, you really just have to go, wait a minute, I, I gotta see whether or not we meet one, one of those exceptions. There's public utility exceptions, there's certain banking exceptions uh, that are even have more uh, details on here. Uh, and then taking one step back, um, there's also a common law conflict. Uh, these are statutory conflicts. These are conflicts where the state statute says you have a statutory conflict and uh, that, that becomes an issue. Uh, common law is really more where there's some kind of a personal advantage or disadvantage where um, you, you decide that you know it would help um, your neighbor to do a variance or something and you feel uncomfortable about it and you're concerned. Or, uh, those are really more of a common law type thing. Those are those things where you want to disqualify yourself because you feel there may be some advantage or disadvantage, um, you can do so. It's still a conflict of interest, but all you have to do is disqualify yourself from voting on that topic. It's not statutory. It's really more of a, a personal advantage or disadvantage type situation. 
Um, I'm not going to go into person's purchasing policy, but that's one of the newer things we did back in 2017. And we're actually going to hit on a few of those things. Uh, TIFs. Uh, real briefly, if you own property in a TIF, uh, you cannot participate in any discussions, comments, or votes on TIFs. Uh, you cannot purchase new property in a TIF or proposed TIF. There are a couple of limited exceptions. Uh, primary residence um, on page 7 in the middle there. Um, if you live in a TIF, of course, you can keep your residence. Um, or a month-to-month -month lease. Uh, if it's not your residence, actually, is another. Uh, with disclosure to the clerk, you can have some interest in TIFs. But in general, if you have property in TIF, you can't participate. Um, village contracts. Uh, I just put a couple of things in here because we'll get into those in the purchasing or just how to do things properly. Um, always remember that uh, there's a list here: one, two, three, four, five. You have to have the power to contract. You've got a proper purpose. Number three is probably the most important. You must have prior appropriation. That must means it's budgeted. There's money budgeted and available for that purchase. If there isn't money that's available, you can't make the purchase. You can move money around, but you need money designated for those purchases. Um, public bidding comes up here once in a while. A recent change uh, last year, actually, it went from 20 to 25,000 as to requirement to publicly bid, and you have to publicly bid any work or other public improvement. Uh, that's kind of the term that comes out of the state statutes. That's basically a permanent improvement to real property. Uh, certain other types of improvements um, do not fall with underneath this uh, requirement. But if you have to do a public bid, you have to uh, advertise it and it goes out to the lowest responsible bidder. Exceptions, uh, these are important. You'll see these in documents that come before the board. Uh, single source, if you buy a pump, water pump from a certain company, and they're the only ones who have parts, you can't go out for bid, you just have to deal with that company, and that's an exception to the bidding statute. If you purchase through a federal, state, or other joint purchasing program, that's fine, that's an authorized uh, exceptions, and then there's the kind of statutory fallback, it's a two-thirds vote of the village board. Uh, lowest responsible uh, bidder, here's a list of some of the things that I always suggest are, in addition to the lowest bid, uh, these other factors can be considered. Uh, just because you're low bid doesn't mean you're the best person for the job. Um, you may have other things that we're concerned about, service, uh, uh, the number of staff they have, the ability to get parts or whatever the issue is, and your staff will, will look at some of those other conditions and come to you once in a while and say, they're not the lowest, but they're the lowest responsible bidder. Very important. Uh, professional services, again, um, you'll see this as we do a lot of uh, engineering work, but engineers, architects, and land surveyors have a separate statute. You have to go through a separate process, and it's basically a demonstrated competence to qualifications type process. You select your highest one, then you negotiate with the contract, what it will be is including the price. If you can't, then you go to number two. That's the process. Now, what you will see is the last sentence there. If you have a satisfactory relationship with an existing engineer, you'll see that a lot with public works. Uh, the engineer did phase one, phase two, we're now at phase three, the construction. We, you'll see in the resolution that we have, and I use that same term, a satisfactory relationship. That's an exemption to this act and we can go directly and deal with them. Uh, these are other things that you have to have in contracts, things like bid security and performance bonds. Um, insurance is just one word there, but we do have a standard insurance package that we require that's it's amended for any contract that comes before the board. Uh, we do have, uh, by state law, requirement for labor and material payment bond uh, because unlike private sector, uh, our contractors cannot put liens on our property. So the only way they can recover is by recovering against the bond. Uh, Prevailing Wage Act changed a little bit this year. I don't think, yeah, I think we do no longer have to do the prevailing wage. Uh, resolution. And they Correct. finally figured it out that everybody adopts the state, so why have to do it every year so you won't see that anymore. Uh, a little less intense process is listening for quotes, which can be done. Um, that's where you don't go out for bid, but you get quotes um, and uh, negotiate with the person who the, you feel has get, mm -hmm. submitted the best quote. Uh, we're going to talk about change orders in a little different there. There are some Anytime you see a statute that starts with 720, that's the criminal code, so those are kind of serious. When you get down to interfering with the bidding process, um, staff can't open a course of bids uh, on the page 10. You can't disclose any information related to the bids. Uh, can't give any information regarding specifications. Can't perform 
someone else about who they need to do subcontractors or any of those kind of things that interfere with the bidding process that is a criminal offense can be done now on the other side um, our contractors can't uh, bid rigging, which is exchanging information between the bidders, or bid rotating, where they decide to, oh, you take it this year, and I'll take it next year. That is a criminal, criminal offense, and uh, bans them for up to five or permanent from uh, the uh, bidding processes. Uh, the next two, are here's another two major issues. One is political activities that are prohibited, and the other one is the Gift Band Act. Um, it's very fact intensive and uh, you want, uh, need to review a lot of times the definitions but prohibited political activities are listed there as A and B no officer including uh, elected officials shall intentionally perform any prohibited political activities don't worry about the prohibited it's basically prohibited a, a, any political activity during any compensated time that means our employees can't do political work when they're working here at the village that's pretty simple and secondly they can't intentionally use any property or resources of the village in connection with any prohibited, uh, well, or any political activity. In other words, you, you can't use the copier to run flyers, you can't use the village boardroom for a political event unless you go through the process of renting it like anyone else would. So, prohibited political activities are important. Um, there actually are rather large definitions of political activity. It basically includes everything, though. I mean, you, you can't do political work on the clock when you're working here. And it's the same thing with uh, even with elected officials. You're not on the clock here, but there's been a couple of decisions that basically held that when you're engaged in your official duties or you're on village property, you can't really be doing political activity. So that's kind of what the rules are. Um, gift band, let's jump right to that. So we don't spend all night here. Uh, gift band, again, is one of those things where if you receive a gift, you should really think, wait a minute, is this permissible or not? And the first section there is real, uh, the rules in section A, no officer employee, and that includes elected officials, or spouse or immediate family members living with the officer employee. So that would include other people that are living uh, as a household together. Uh, shall intentionally solicit or accept any gift. And gift is a defined term. That basically means any type of, it doesn't have to be a, a thing. It can be tickets, it can be any kind of thing that has value. Uh, from any prohibited source. And prohibited source is also a defined term. If you, and a prohibited source, uh, the definition is uh, back under page 14. It's someone who, if you see there, um, seeking official action from the village, somebody who's asking for something from the village, does business or seeks to do business with the village or the employee, uh, conducts activities related um, that are regulated by the village. That's our businesses in town where we regulate them. Um, or has an interest or maybe substantially affected by the performance or non-performance by the village. Um, so all those people who either want something or are regulated by this basically fall within that. And the reason is, of course, you don't want to have those people thinking that if, you know, that they have to give a gift or uh, give, a, give something uh, to get the same public service that anyone else would receive. There are some exceptions and they start there on page 11. Uh, they're pretty general. The ones that everybody talks about are on the next page. Um, number eight, food or refreshments not exceeding $75 per person on a single calendar day. So if there's a prohibited source, someone who either wants something or is being regulated by the village and wants to take you out for dinner or, dinner or lunch, you can do that as long as it's less than $75 and it's consumed on the premise. Now that sounds a little strange, but that's what the rule is. If it's not consumed on the premise uh, or it's 70, over $75, is a problem. Now, with that, though, you jump down to number 12, there is a total ban on any type of items received from a prohibited source having a cumulative value of, oop, oh, that's the exception, yeah, it's less than 100. If it's, oh, if it's less than a 100, it has to be less than $100 a year. So even though you can do $75 one day, you can't do $75 the next day because that puts you over $100. So the bottom line rule is, from a prohibited source, you can accept things up to $100 in one year. And uh, excuse me, just a second. Sure. Obviously, that discounts uh, uh, donations like your political campaign. Correct. That's an yeah. exception to the requirements that was on the page before. I, I didn't go into all these. Okay. I don't want to spend all the yeah. time. But yeah, the um, uh, election code items oh, okay. are number three. Go. Go. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And you can look at uh, gifts from relatives, gifts from friends, although you're very sure they're friends. <clears throat> um, there's certain things here about fair market value. Where other things that are given that anyone could receive. In other words, if everybody in the community gets a 
three something, uh, you can get that for the same three something from the, from the business. Um, if under C there on page 12, what happens if you do accidentally accept that gift? You accept those tickets to the Cubs or Sox um, and it's over $100, you got a couple of options. One is to return the gift or alternatively, you can give an amount um, uh, equal to the value to a charity, 501c3 charity. So that's the solution. Um, <clears throat> if you get caught in that kind of situation. Again, it's, there's a, it's, it's a fine. Um, I'm not going to go through the definitions in the next few pages, but yeah, this is what the state statute talks about. And that's why a lot of times it's helpful just to call Kathy I or, or Rich and go, Oop, what is this? Uh, do we have a problem? Um, getting over to page 15, official misconduct. This is a, um, <laughs> the statute that uh, basically is an add-on statute. Uh, I just saw it used again. Somebody in Chicago got indicted and they, um, I think it was bribery, I forget what I thought. Um, and they also then are charged with official misconduct. And you kind of go, why is that? Well, the reason is official misconduct is a class three felony, very serious. So what it does though, if you look under the statute up above there, one intentionally or recklessly fails to perform any mandatory duty, knowingly performs any act he knows he is forbidden by law to perform, tend to obtain personal advantage, blah, blah, blah. Those basically refer to all the criminal and there's some civil statutes that if you violate those statutes, they're going to fall within those one, two, three, four, and they're also going to be able to charge you, those individuals, with official misconduct. So, you know, it's, it's serious because it's a class three felony and it's going to be one of those things that they can add on to uh, if anything does happen. You'll see it in Chicago quite often uh, when, they, when they go after um, problems with elected officials. Um, I did throw in a little bit about the Open Meetings Act. This changes every year. Uh, basically, if you have a meeting, you got to follow the act. It's, that's kind of the bottom line. And a meeting is defined as the majority of a quorum. Um, so for us, seven members here, uh, quorum is four. Uh, majority of four is three. So if three of you get together, and it, the intent is to discuss public business, that's a public meeting. It must follow all the requirements. Now. The issues of the requirements, everything from notice to minutes and all these other things we'll talk about briefly, but it's important to know these rules so you don't get caught up in a situation where there's somebody up complaining that there was a meeting of three or more trustees and there was no notice and no compliance with the Open Meetings Act. Uh, for the new trustees, go down our training, you have 90 days to go to the uh, Attorney General's website, there's a little tutorial and you have to pass a little test. And you gotta do that once, and you bring in the certificate and give it to Hosanna. And she keeps that on file. That's just one of the requirements of the Open Meetings Act. Um, there are exemptions from the act, of course. Um, uh, you don't have to have closed meetings if you don't want to. Uh, exemptions are strictly construed. Courts and the Attorney General's office especially says, um, just with this and uh, Freedom of Information Act, very restrictive as to any kind of exceptions. You can't take final action, I'm now on page 17, at a closed meeting, very important. Now what this doesn't say though is you can't give, it doesn't say you cannot give direction. You can't take a final action if at a closed meeting there's a discussion of an acquisition of property, you can give directions to your attorneys or to Rich to offer a certain amount and enter into a contract. Uh, but that contract comes back to the board and that board approves that contract. You don't really approve the purchase in the executive session, all you do is direct us to go forward to get you that contract. So that's not taking final action, that's just basically giving directions to the staff. Um, there's a long list of closed meeting topics. I've got a few of the more popular ones here. Um, compensation, employment of an employee, collective negotiating matters, that's your, your bargaining issues as you go through that process. Uh, appointment or discipline of a person in public office, purchase, sale of property, uh, probable pending litigation uh, when we bring issues to you where we've been sued or we're going to sue somebody, um, those are held of course in closed meetings because there are discussions as to how we want to proceed. Uh, closed session minutes, again, uh, those also are always done in, in uh, closed session as to be reviewed and then there's decisions whether or not those are going to be released. I, I, I copied this from some, one of my other handouts, but um, there's been some changes in the last couple of years again about the agenda. Um, there's some issues regarding the sufficiency of the described action. Um, the agenda must describe in somewhat reasonable detail what we're going to actually consider. You can't have an ordinance that says, this is an ordinance to amend Chapter 5 of the Municipal Code. 
you can have an ordinance that says we're going to amend the regulations regarding chickens, but you can't just say it's going to amend Chapter 5, because when somebody looks at that, that's not going to be sufficient. That's why the ordinances that I draft and, and Kathy does have sometimes a little longer <coughs> title, because we want to make it as clear as possible when somebody looks at the agenda what we're actually going to be doing. So that's important. Um, regular meetings, you can discuss other topics. Uh, if you do a special meeting, you also have to have an agenda, but you're limited, of course, to the agenda topics. Um, notice of meetings is always important. Uh, 48 hours. Um, news media get special notice if they ask for it. Uh, emergency meetings, you have to give notice as soon as possible. On page 18, one of the things that comes up quite often is, what happens if you want to cancel a meeting? You can't meet, if you don't have a quorum, if you don't have four members, the village board can't meet. Now you can't go, well, we don't have four members, so we're informally going to do something. You can't meet if you don't have <laughs> four members. And the same thing with planning, zoning boards, and other things. Um, what I always recommend is you put a notice on the door so people who would come see that notice and know what the, that meeting is continued to. It's really not a continuance. You didn't have to just publish it as either a regular meeting or a special meeting in the future. But that notice on the door helps with uh, zoning topics that you have to republish. That's kind of important. Uh, closed meetings or executive sessions, as they're called, um, as long as you're an open meeting, you can make a motion to go in a closed session at any time. Only topics that are specified in the motion are allowed. Um, minutes, you don't have to worry about that. Rosanna does a great job Take care of your minutes. <coughs> One of the new things, um, right to speak at every public meeting, <coughs> you have to have uh, no occasion to be able to speak. I'm sorry, my voice. I, I was with the grandkids at a water park, and <laughs> <coughs> in it, uh, they gave me something. I think at the water park, but uh, <coughs> um, we can do it by phone. Your attendance, if there's a forum present. <coughs> oh boy, I'm falling apart. Let's go to. <coughs> Social media. One, two, three. Uh, I'm going to go over to page 20. I want to talk about the Virginia case real quickly here before I lose my voice. In Virginia, someone had a web uh, Facebook page. Or tell because the way they did it, <coughs> it turned into a public forum. And that individual could not delete negative comments, got sued, and was held to violate someone's first amendment rights. So, very carefully, <coughs> you're going to have to separate your business issues from your personal issues and keep those two things separate. Um, Freedom of Information Act, I'm not going to go into. Um, I, I'm going to end it here real quickly. Attached is <coughs> a real good list of kind of the top ten <coughs> things. I don't know. Rich, why don't you want to take these, but I'm going to lose my voice here in a minute. Sure. Why don't you go through these top ten things? Go ahead. Go ahead. <coughs> this is a very good list, top ten. So it's uh, tips for newly elected municipal officials, and I believe it's from the IML, if I'm yes. not uh, mistaken. Um, it's ideas and suggestions from an experienced local government professional. Uh, one, it, it takes... Uh, Two and it's uh, four with an asterisk to tango. Your Honor, would you like me to read the whole paragraph? Yeah, go ahead. Want. <laughs> so it takes two uh, to four to tango. So even if you have an idea that surpasses the collective wisdom of all municipal knowledge, you still need at least three members of the Board of Trustees to agree with you to make it happen. Treat every public policy issue as a collaborative venture. If your idea or initiative does not work, move on and do not take it personally. There are plenty of other ideas you will bring to the table during your term of office. Uh, the next is uh, read your stuff and ask questions. Many hours are put into preparing agenda items that appear in the meeting packet. The staff goal is to present elected officials with the information necessary to make an informed decision. This is a resource for your benefit as a policy maker. If you have questions or feel information is missing on any agenda item, let the village manager or appropriate staff number know before 
the meaning. Next is hear all sides of the story. When approached with a concern, it is best not to commit to any action or express an opinion until you hear all sides of the issue. It is not uncommon for a neighbor, friend, business owner, builder, or land use petitioner to share a concern without providing you with all of the details. First check with your staff and others who may provide valuable insight. It is better to say you will look into the matter to avoid a potential need to backtrack and change your position later. Next, executive sessions are confidential. There are no exceptions to this rule until the village board either takes official action on a matter or votes to release executive session minutes. This applies to the specific topic of discussion as well as the content of the discussion. A breach of executive <coughs> session is a betrayal of the trust of the elected and appointed members of the organization. Next, one cannot have ten number one priorities. Resources of time, funding, and personnel are limited. New projects and initiatives take all of the above. Be sensitive to the in initiation of new ideas and realize that priorities may need to be realigned to accomplish new goals. Moreover, remember that four <coughs> to tango thing to get your number one priority accomplished. Next, uh, don't lose sight of the forest for the trees. Hopefully your community has adopted a plan to provide the strategic direction of the organization. If not, make it your number one priority. This will likely be updated during your term of office to add your ideas. While you will be involved in making hundreds of decisions, sometimes small, some large, during your term of office, always ask yourself how the next decision supports the strategic plan. Next, elected officials are a team. Despite the fact that each member of the Board of Trustees would, was individually elected, the Board remains a single team the level of dis discourse, civility, honesty, and collaboration determines the public perception and effectiveness of the entire body. Debate and differences of opinion result in better outcomes when there is a spirit of trust and respect. Each member of the team needs to support the decisions of the team once they are made. Undercutting the decision or working behind the scenes to discredit the action is disruptive to building a climate of trust and respect. Next, follow the chain of command. The village administrator supervises the staff. The president of village board supervises the village administrator. If there are concerns to be addressed, the village administrator is the individual who needs to be contacted. Routine inquiries or questions should certainly be directed to staff. Next is praise in public, criticize in private. A good rule to follow whether the recipient is a fellow elected official or a member of staff is to praise in public and criticize in private. And next, and we even pay them to work here. As with the private sector, wages and the ability to achieve future economic rewards make an organization attractive to individuals re when recruiting, recruiting for talent. Some communities establish a plan that creates a philosophy of paying at a particular level, i.e. the upper 40% of comparable communities. An organization willing to pay for talent will generally attract experienced applicants. But since the labor market is, after all, still a market, you may gain experience as well as lose it to competing communities. Attracting and retaining a quality team is core to providing better services to residents. Employees remain motivated and gender and energized when there is a healthy mix of economic rewards, good working conditions, professional challenges, and the knowledge that they are value. This delicate balance needs to be nurtured. Remember the smell test. Public officials operate in a fishbowl. Our actions, comments, and behavior are continually judged whether we like it or not. Sometimes appearances matter more than substance. If it smells a void, if it smells, avoid it, even if it's legal. Trust and integrity take a long time to establish, but can be lost in a minute. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I think the last uh, ten things are, are really important. Um, actually, uh, I use that last one quite a bit. 
when I talk to staff, I also they often say, well, can we do it? Is it legal? And sometimes it's not a legal question. It's really a question of, I say, listen, can you stand before this village board, explain what happened, and feel good about your explanation? And if they say yes, I said, well, then that's probably a good decision. If they say, oh, maybe I don't like that, um, then maybe that's not a good, good decision. So I, I think that's just kind of a good overview. There's also a nice list on improving meetings, which we probably could talk about sometime. But going back to the ethics, um, it's important to know what the issues are so that if you have a problem, contact us, we'll look at it. I just want to add a couple things. Uh, my experience is if you have any questions on anything, anything on the agenda or anything that's going on in town, it, it's, it always has worked best for me if those questions are directed to the village manager. Uh, staff, staff may already have a list of uh, uh, objectives that they that the village manager wants them to do on a certain day or items that they want to have he wants to have done so rich generally knows is able to answer any questions that you have or if he can't then he'll refer to the proper person I just also want to stress the uh, executive session confidentiality uh, for that to work well we have to be confident in executive session that the discussions we have in there uh, not just get out to the general public if we're in a property purchase but it also allows the trustees to have an open and candid discussion and uh, and that type of thing if it gets out into the public that somebody is adamantly uh, disagreeing about an item uh, it just doesn't not only can ruin a, um, a purchase or something but also can ruin relationships so if we're going to have open discussions in executive sessions, it's very important that we uh, keep those discussions confidential. So, so I, I have a question to ask you. Sure. It's, it's, I know there's a lot on social media or whatever, mm -hmm. but on, on a statement when we speak as an individual on, on a subject that could come up to the board, are we basically considered a board member on that topic and we should avoid it? Well, no, you have a right to, to speak. Uh, what's important is on social media, um, there, there is a social media policy, which I think that was what was handed down. Um, the person who represents the village is the village manager on your social media policy. You can't say I'm representing the village. You can say I'm the village trustee and here's my opinion, but remember that to represent the village it's the board that represents the village, and this board has decided that the village manager is the person who does that. Okay, I just I just wanted to know because a lot of issues in my job we have, we have to make a line because you can't talk for well, the company type thing because you're actually you know you aren't the well as a whole we're the board but no, you, you don't you don't lose your right for the company. No, you don't lo lose your rights to, to make comments. Now it's more probably appropriate to make those comments in a public forum in a public meeting. Uh, but if you want to make those public comments, what, what was uh, interesting about that case before I had my, my, my little attack, um, the courts are now starting to say that if you have a Facebook or other type of um, social media, it may turn into some of a quasi-government site. That's kind of a strange concept, but that's where these courts are headed right now. What that means, though, is that individuals um, who criticize, like they did in this case, can't be taken off. Their comments can't be taken off. Um, if you have contemporaneous, contemporaneous discussions and there's three elected officials doing it, that turns into a meeting. You really can't do that. Uh, you've got to be careful. Um, uh, there's also some comments about your private um, Facebook sites, if they're turned into a public forum, may fall under the requirements of freedom of information requests. Okay. What happens if somebody comes in and says, "I, you know, this is a public forum. I want to see all the information that was, it, that you know, that gets real complicated." That's why I'm saying, take your village functions, put them on the village's side, and keep your private functions on the private side. Try to separate those as best you can. So don't use your, don't talk about your village stuff on your well, social media. You, you thing. can still is talk that about what you're it. Saying about your what? Yeah. That's because I know they've got a line going on that. I yeah. mean, if you have a Facebook page and you want to, people on your Facebook page that they're starting to say that, as you say, it's you start make a comment about village stuff and make a comment that they could forward that site. 
right. even though it's your individual Facebook site. That area of law right now is going to change quite a bit in the next uh, year or so. I think there's going to be some some other decisions on that. But my best advice is keep the keep the two separate because we get freedom of information requests, and courts have already ruled that if you do government business on your personal site, we have to ask you to give us those emails. Yeah. And I don't think you want to do that. At least if it's on the government site, we have a we have a way to search that. So somebody comes in and says, I want to see everything that anybody said about chickens. You know, we can actually search for chickens. But they say, well, what about those trustees who, you know, on their private, well, you know, if you don't, if you can advise us that you don't discuss public business on your private accounts, um, that, that, that's kind of the end of that discussion. But, you know, Chicago got in a lot of trouble because they were merging these decisions back and forth. Keep your, keep your, you've got a work email, you've got a village email address, that's where all your village stuff should be going. Let, let the people comment there, let them contact you there. Um, that seems to be better than trying to do it on, uh, on your own personal site. Now, can you, can you still have a personal site? Yeah, there's no question you can have a personal site, you can have discussions there, but village business, keep it on the village site. Anything else? Anybody? Any questions on it? Yeah. Just read over the material and get a lot of answers. Right. President Wolf, I just have one question. Yep. So this issue has come up at some commission meetings where they are expecting a quorum right. and they don't have a quorum right. uh, and they recognize that they can't transact business, but they may say, okay, well, let's review what we have coming up in the future. No. No, can't do it. Can't do it. What can they talk about if there's not a quorum? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> they have it's, not, it's not a public meeting. Yeah, all they can do is decide on a date to have another public meeting. Okay. Yeah, that's really all they can do. Yeah, um, there's been some there's some confusion about that, I think. Well, no, I, I, it's not here, it's everywhere. I mean, I've had other ones who, um, planning zoning commissions, well, we don't have our four, but we got three, so let's just go ahead and hear the testimony today and we'll put it on the record. No, you can't. It, it's a public it's either a public meeting or it's not. If it's if you've got a quorum, you can have a public meeting. If you don't, it's not a public meeting. You can't do anything. You can't sit and discuss. You can't do it informally. You can't sit around and chit chat. No. Gotcha. It's just the answer is it's not a public meeting. Understood. Thank yeah. you. Hmm. That's why you need to have your enough staff on those committees to get four people. Okay. Well, then we're going to go on now to clerk's report. No report. <laughs> <laughs> Village trustee. Oh. We'll start on the right, trustee uh, yeah. Patrick. Um, the only thing that I have is uh, over the weekend, uh, the two of us were able to attend the uh, the DuPage Rail Safety Committee uh, meeting. Uh, just came away with some uh, valuable information um, about um, about uh, safety on the railroads. That was really good uh, good information. Yes, it was. Trustee Silao. No report this evening. Trustee Cazal? I, I want just one thing. I know Justin was up here earlier talking about the um, spring sweep, and um, I just want to give a shout out to Teresa Bauer because that, that was really her idea from about a year and a half ago, and I think she did a great job. Um, and like Justin said, she really got the organizations involved. She got the um, Environmental Concerns Committee involved, commu Commission involved in public works and staff and the village manager and, and Kelly and just about everybody. So I think, you know, big shout out to Teresa and obviously uh, to everybody else that was involved with it. And that's it. Thank you. Got one, one more thing. I apologize. Uh, over the weekend too, we also had Cop on a Roof. That was a pretty successful event as well. Um, Chief, I think you said that we had over $3,300 worth of donations uh, from that event. So that also was a very successful event. Oh, great. Murphy, Capacity Murphy. Anything? Uh, just one quick thing, and it's again expanding on the success of the spring sweep in addition to our gratitude expressed to all the employees and organizations that put that together. I would like to extend that further to our residents who took time to gather all of their things, and I had several residents as they dropped their things off. Uh, expressing gratitude for us in having the event so it was a success from everyone's perspective so thank you to the residents as well trustee Tucker um, I'd just like to congratulate the 2019 class 
the, both the preschool and the high schoolers have both graduated. I don't know about the junior high yet, but congratulate them and wish them luck on their future. Um, Want to say the residents make sure Memorial Day weekend that you remember it's a holiday. Think safety, please. Um, we don't want any. We don't want our police to have to work too hard, please, <laughs> for Memorial Day weekend. So please uh, think of safety on that weekend. Um, the VFW is doing their memorial service on Monday, hopefully at Cortez Park if the weather cooperates. I don't have any permission on that, but you might want to get a hold of the VFW to find more on it. Um, I could find a listing off their website, so I was trying to find that. And I wish Jan luck, because this will be our last board meeting with you, my understanding is you will be gone at the end of this month, so I wish you luck in your new endeavor. Okay, Trustee Wagner. Thanks, President Brothers. Just a couple things. Uh, the Environmental Concerns Committee Commission will be meeting this coming Thursday, uh, May 23rd, here at Village Hall at 7 p.m. And uh, the commission is going to have a special guest. Uh, we will have a uh, county board member uh, from District 2, Liz Chaplin, who is the chair of the Environmental Committee for the county. She'll be present and kind of talk about some of the activities that the county is undertaking that's relevant to us. I um, want to let folks know that uh, planning has started uh, for the 2019 Love Your Neighbor Day. Uh, it's going to be held on uh, September 28th um, and it's spearheaded by the Christian Church of Villa Park. Uh, it starts at 8 o'clock. There'll be more information available about Love Your Neighbor Day and of course the village has in the past uh, supported that and they're very grateful for that support. And uh, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but uh, I think uh, the uh, Spring Sweep event was a great event. Uh, it kind of shows what we can do and we all work together. Uh, it couldn't have been pulled off without the help of staff. And I want to recognize Rich Salerno and Kelly Cookley for all the work that they did. And the, the, the folks that got the biggest work out were the people that were working, that were collecting electronics. And uh, that was... a. Chief Lay, <laughs> Manager Keener, and Rich Salerno, and uh, you know, and uh, so they really they really worked their tails off on Saturday. So uh, just just a great event, and I know that there'll be a planning meeting to talk about what we've learned and how to improve it. And I know there's certain costs involved with, especially with the electronics, what it cost us to collect all those items. So. Um, you know, it's going to continue, and I'm, I'm, I know that um, the team is going to, you know, work on making it better uh, for next year. So that's all I had. Okay. And I also want to recognize Jan Fiola. We're going to miss you. You've done great work. You know, I mean, I really appreciate everything you've done. So thank you. Okay. And that's all I had. All right. Yeah, a couple items I have. Uh, two. Uh, Attorney Binninger is leaving. He's retiring too. So this is his last meeting here. Yeah. It's been, uh, boy, how many, 10, 10 years Almost that 10 I know. Years with yeah. Kathy, yeah. yeah, so. <laughs> Spend more time with my grandkids than they give me more colds. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that <laughs> happens. So I yeah. thank you for your uh, assistance that you've given me uh, since I've been president too. So always willing to take my phone calls. And I too would like to thank Jan. She's retiring also. And uh, I'm kind of envious, you know. <laughs> She's uh, got some other activities she's going to do with her and her husband. So uh, enjoy your uh, time together. So, and thank you very much for uh, your time here in Villa Park. Really appreciate it. We made some great uh, moves forward uh, in, the, in the economic development. So appreciate it. Thank you. And good luck. So, and we'll move the manager's report. Well, thank you, Honor. I, I just want to mention one uh, item about the uh, recycling event on Saturday. I'm not sure if anyone mentioned it, but we had over 500 vehicles in four hours. And the folks uh, that brought the recycling items to the event really didn't have to exit their cars. So we either unloaded from their trunks or their back seats. Uh, in fact, I think almost every single one uh, that I helped uh, thanked me and, and told me how much they enjoyed the event. So 
over 500 vehicles in four hours. It was pretty warm out there, Your Honor. It was warm. So uh, I, too, want to say thank you to uh, Director of Economic uh, Development, Janet Fiola. She'll be missed. And, uh, you know, she fits really well with the department heads and, as a team. And as I tell them all the time, that all of our pistons fire um, and do very well. But I also tell her that now that she's leaving, that so for the next six months, anything that goes wrong, it's because of Jan. Oh, yeah, no doubt about it. So <laughs> that's just the way it is. I know it's Venus. Well, Venus is past, now it's Jan. Or it could be Jim since he's that's kicking right. us that's to the right. curb. So it's been a pleasure working with Jan. It's been a pleasure working with Jim. So yep. thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, we have item 15 is an executive session, which would be 5L. 5 ILCS 120-2, C1 personnel matters, C2 collective bargaining matters, C5 purchase and lease of property, C6 sale and lease of property, C11 pending litigation, and C21 discussion on closed session minutes. Do we have a motion for executive okay. session? President Pultis, so I'd make that motion. Okay. Do we have a second? Trustee Cazone? I'll second it. Okay. Um, roll call vote. Hey, Trustee. Silella? Yes. Trustee Tucker? Yes. Trustee Cazone? Yes. Trustee Wagner? Yes. Trustee Patrick? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. President Bolfus? Yes. And with that, we're going into executive session. Our next meeting is on June 10th at 7 o'clock right here in Village Hall. Have a nice holiday weekend, everybody. We're not coming back from executive session.